Wonderful. Well, it's two o'clock on a very rainy afternoon in Ithaca, New York, and uh, I'm delighted to have here uh, someone from Pennsylvania and Vermont. Um, and we're going to be talking about pest management in no-till corn silage systems. And also we have Deb Haliba here from the Northeast SARE, and she's going to share with us about their funding programs and their resources. So welcome, Deb. Welcome, John. And I'll introduce them in a moment. And uh, John, if you could forward the slide for me, please. Um, so what there is to know is there is a recording of this uh, webinar that's going to be available within a week. And uh, we also will put up the full slides uh, set so you don't need to furiously um, write uh, notes. So you'll be able to download both of those. And I'll also give you uh, a link at the end of where you'll be able to find the recording. And uh, 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 John, next slide, please. Great. So we're going to use a really nifty feature from, uh, from uh, Zoom, which is the Q&A feature. So if you scroll your mouse over, the, over the, your Zoom box, you should see at the bottom or the top of your screen, there'll be a menu bar. And in the middle of that, there'll be some of this like little file looking box um, that says Q&A. And if you click on that, you can ask questions. And uh, we have Nancy Casamano and our team who is going to be, um, who's going to be uh, looking at the questions and we'll take some breaks. We have uh, four breaks scheduled for asking questions and um, we'd love it to be interactive. So send us lots of your questions. And um, so we'll be taking breaks. Try please not to use the chat feature for that because um, uh, because it's much harder for us to keep track of the questions uh, when, when we do that. And next slide, please. All right, so we have some questions and um, I'm going to uh, open up a poll and we have two questions for you. So the first is, what region are you located in? Your options are the Northeast, the South, North Central, and the West. And uh, what is your background? Are you a homeowner, home gardener, farmer, green industry, researcher, extension, uh, or pest control company? Probably not too many of those, but maybe, or an other. And I'm just going to leave this uh, open for a few minutes, or for a minute. And uh, once a decent number of people have voted, I will be able to show you the results. And it's helpful for us because it gives our presenters an idea of um, the background of the people that we're, we're talking with today. So, so we're up to 76%. So one, one more person, there we go. Okay, gosh, 92% of people have voted. I think we can end the poll, there we go. All right, and I can share the results. So uh, almost everybody is in the Northeast and, um, and we have quite a few home gardeners and some researchers, but most of all, we have extension personnel. All right, so with that, um, I would like to uh, introduce our two speakers today. And we have um, Deb Haliba, she's gonna be our first speaker. And she's a regional communications specialist with Northeast SER, a regional competitive grants and sustainable agriculture education program funded by USDA NIFA. And we're also funded by USDA NIFA, so they're a sister organization. And we have John Tucker, who's an associate professor of entomology at Penn State University. His areas of expertise include insect ecology, plant insect interactions, and conservation biological control. He's worked with no-till farms for more than 15 years. John and his graduate students have conducted several research projects with funding from Northeast SER to better understand the role of insecticidal seed treatments in no-till corn silage systems. And that's what we're going to be hearing about today. So, uh, John, if you can move the slide forward, please. And we're going to uh, welcome, first of all, welcome Deb. Thank you for being here and taking the time to share with us today. And could you tell us uh, what no uh, the Northeast SARE is and a little bit about background of your organization? Sure, of course. Thanks, thanks, Yana. Um, so hopefully um, folks on the um, webinar have heard of SARE, but if not, SARE stands for the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. 
Um, as Jana said, we're a national program funded by USDA NIFA. And for the last 30 years, we've been providing competitive grants and educational resources to advance sustainable agriculture and food systems across the United States. So our program is organized by region and um, so that we can better address the specific needs of farmers in our, our, our local areas. So Northeast Air um, includes the 12 Northeast states and District of Columbia. Great. We can just move to the next slide. Great, so if you'd like, would you like, I know you have different competitive grant programs than we do and uh, offer a greater variety. So would you talk us through what you have? Sure, so here listed you can see our uh, six competitive grant programs that we currently offer. Um, each targets a different type of applicant and they def have different scopes um, that they address, scope of work. Um, as you can imagine, um, given the diversity of farming um, in the Northeast, the topics that we fund are pretty varied. Um, you know, from pest management to production concerns, marketing and quality of life issues. And we also cover the full range of types of uh, farming in the Northeast on land and at sea. Um, and as a pest uh, management example, um, pictured here, we have Dr. Paul Rawson, who's at the University of Maine. Um, he's talking to some colleagues about um, his SNARE grant, which is looking at blister worm which is a pest of oysters. Mm -hmm. So I did wanna talk about two specific grant programs. So maybe if we can get to the next slide. Um, so our farmer grants uh, program um, is a program that funds research conducted by farmers themselves. Um, and um, the call for proposals is currently open right now. So I wanted to make sure folks knew about that. Um, we are accepting online applications until November 27th. Um, and um, we um, are having a webinar, a webinar talking about a webinar. Um, we're having a webinar coming up on October 10th um, where our farmer grant program coordinator, Carol Delaney, will give uh, an overview of our farmer grant program. So um, we encourage you to, if you're interested, um, to sign up there. Um, and then, Go ahead. Is that something I noticed on the slide it says you have a farmer in charge but a technical advisor is required so can you tell me a little bit does that mean you need to have a researcher or a sure sure so while the farmer um, conducts their own project um, we do require a technical advisor and that could be someone to it's basically someone to su provide support um, to the farmer um, so that could be a researcher, an extension educator, uh, nonprofit staff, NRCS, federal or state agency person, even another farmer. So it's just someone to just help the farmer along wherever they need help, um, whether it's, you know, setting up the research um, trial design or helping with outreach. So it's pretty variable in terms of what that technical advisor might um, do based on where the farmer is at um, with their comfort level with the okay. research. Great, thank you. Yeah, and so next slide. Um, we also, I also wanted to mention our partnership grant um, program, and that's um, funds research that are conducted by ag service providers. So those are conducted by extension educators, researchers, um, the nonprofit staff, or other um, ag service providers that work directly with farmers to conduct the project. Um, and um, uh, the, the information that John is going to share in a little while um, is, was in part funded by um, partnership grants. So that's a really good, um, will be a really good example of the types of projects that we fund. Um, for those of you that may be familiar with partnership grants, um, we do have a few changes that I wanted to make folks aware of. So first we've increased um, the, the cap on our projects to 30,000, which hopefully will allow for us to better accommodate multiple year grants, um, transdisciplinary, multiple partners. So we're pretty excited about that. And then we also have changed the deadline. We typically have had them due in the fall, but we're moving it to the spring. So we can expect um, a deadline of April, 2019. And then next slide. So SARE also offers a wealth of um, different kinds of resources. Um, 
we require our all of our um, uh, project grantees to file reports that are available to the public um, and they're on our searchable online database and that's across the country so you can get project reports um, from all the way back from 1988 when we first started to present day um, and then um, uh, we have uh, publications of fact sheets bulletins books um, guides, all sorts of different kinds of educational um, products that have come out of some of the funded pro projects that we've done, but also from our national SARE outreach um, office. So those are all available online um, through our database or, or on our website. Um, and so with the searchable online database, presumably someone could go there and search for IPM related uh, projects. Yep, yep, you can do a keyword search. Um, so if you're just interested in spotted wing drosophila as an example, you could you could search there. If you're just interested in projects in your, you know, in West Virginia, you could do that as well. Cool. Yeah. So that's um next slide. So that's about all I have. Here's our um our website where you can find um all of our grant application materials, um, the resources that I mentioned. Um Lots of good stuff. Great, terrific. And, uh, and it looks like we don't have any questions, but if you do have a question uh, for Deb, feel free to type it in and maybe at the next question uh, break that we can, uh, we can go back to that and Deb will be here for the entire time. So happy to answer your questions. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So, um, so John, we'll turn it over to you. And uh, yes, I, first of all, before we, before we get anywhere, I've been looking at this uh, picture for the last few days. <laughs> what is that a photo picture of? Uh, that's a jumping spider, um, and it's not color enhanced. So it happens that it's um, chelicery, or those two fang looking things in the front actually are blue. Um, it's a fairly common little beast. Sometimes you'll see them running around crop fields. Sometimes you'll see them in your yard, but they're relatively common jumping spiders. Yeah. Well, that's a great photograph, so wonderful. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about uh, some background about no-till farming and um, pest prevalence that would be helpful for us to have before we dive into learning about your project? Yeah, sure. Uh, there's certainly a belief in the world that when a farmer moves to no-till, that pests are either more abundant or, or they're just worse. Um, our research is finding out that's not so much the case. It's more of a perception issue, and it has to do with a suite of pests that um, farmers can expect to encounter. Um, but I'll get into that in more detail in the heart of the talk here. What else did you want to know, Yana? Well, I think you're going to cover it in this first section. Oh. So, and, uh, I, and to just have some background before we go into uh, learning about the research project that you're going to tell us about. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I should, I should go then, huh? Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in, all. Um, and Deborah's, Deborah's indeed right that the first efforts that I've made um, as a researcher were in collaboration with a farmer uh, here in Pennsylvania, and I'll highlight some of that work in the last third of my talk. So uh, it's an inadvertent advertisement for the SARE partnership program. Okay, so... Um, Pennsylvania um, is not alone in this, but many other states also are no-till states. But Pennsylvania is clearly a no-till state. We have about 75% of our large acreage crops are um, managed without tillage. Um, and this, of course, has clear benefits, including decreasing labor costs because you go across the field fewer times, it decreases fuel costs. But on the conservation side, it certainly conserves soil and water resources. And that can be a great thing. Um, but there is this perception that moving to no-till uh, makes, uh, makes pests more abundant because you're not controlling the pests with tillage. So tillage is a great way to control, or is a way to control weeds, is a, control, it's a way to control some invertebrate pests. Um, European corn borer used to be controlled by a lot of people using tillage. So there's an assumption that people make that when you move to no-till that you'll have a more abundant pest populations. And we're finding out that's not the case. Our research that's been going on in my lab has shown that that's not the case at all. Um, but the suite of pests does differ a little bit from what you tend to find in a tilled system. So here are just four species that you tend to encounter if you're growing corn, for example, in a no-till system. You'll tend to encounter black cutworm, true armyworm, stock borer, and wireworm more often than you would in a no-till system. 
So is that yeah. why is that why there's the perception that there are more pests because you're seeing things that you don't normally see? Exactly right. That's our impression. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hard to say exactly why people believe what they believe, but there's this embedded feeling that you get worse pests in no-till. Um, but we're not finding that to be the case. But that can be the case when it comes to these guys. So one of the more challenging pests that you'll encounter in no-till systems are slugs. And this is a picture of a hay mower. Um, this is from 2012, which is a particularly good slug year if you're a researcher or a bad slug year if you're a farmer. Um, and this is a, a hay mower that went through a field during the evening. So the slugs are up on the plants and that brown coverage on the front of the mower is all slugs. So this gentleman didn't realize he had a slug problem until he was harvesting his hay. Um, but indeed, all the things on that uh, mower are slugs. Um, and just to recognize something you probably know, but to say it out loud, is that slugs are mollusks, so they're not insects. So generally speaking, if you want to kill a mollusk, you should use a molluscicide, or if you want to kill an insect, you should use an insecticide. And um, the story that I'll tell today has something to do with the specificity of various um, pesticides and uh, what you can expect out of them. All right, so let's get into a little bit about slugs. So this um, overview that I'm gonna provide really can be considered a case study. So because slugs are in a different order, uh, sorry, a different phylum, they're more challenging to control. My view is that if you can control slugs, other things should be a whole lot easier. So if we can manage slugs, then black cutworm or true armyworm should be relatively easy. So uh, as a little background, some of the um, uh, backyard gardeners um, have experienced slugs, I'm sure. Um, they probably know that slugs can damage nearly anything you grow. Um, we have just started growing canola in Pennsylvania, maybe about 10 years now or so. And slugs adore canola. They really do well on soybeans. Um, they can do well on alfalfa and small grains. And they'll eat corn and they'll eat it um, abundantly, it seems. But an interesting detail here is that they don't really like corn. So if you give them something else besides corn, they'll tend to prefer that over corn. And that'll play into a, the third part of my talk today. And we'll come back to that. But on average, um, about 20% of no-till acreage in the mid-Atlantic state suffers yield loss from slugs each year. And that's not nothing, so it comes into about 600,000 acres. Um, in terms of the entire Corn Belt, that's a very small amount, but in terms of a, uh, the mid-Atlantic or the Northeast, that's a significant amount of acreage, and it's even more significant when it's your acreage. So keep that in mind. Just a couple images if you haven't experienced slug damage before. In the upper right hand corner is a cornfield with a large bear patch in it. And that's ten, that tends to be what you see with slug infestations. Slugs are more abundant in a low lying section of the field where it lays moist or there's a, an abundance of residue for whatever reason. Um, in the lower right hand corner, it's kind of a pale picture, but you can see that's kind of slug feeding damage. They tend to cause this um, slicing damage or shredding damage to corn. In the lower left, that's a soybean field that's largely denuded of soybeans. Uh, in the upper left is the damage they cause on cotyledon stage soybeans. They'll feed so heavily that the cotyledons will fall off, the growing tip will, will die, and you're not going to get any more growth after that, of course. So they can be problematic. So there are these benefits to no-till. Um, it does not include or does not harbor more abundant pests, at least by our assessments. Um, but one great thing that no-till does is it hosts a greater abundance of, of beneficial insects and specifically predators. So once you start no-tilling for a while, you'll start to see even more predator populations than you ever saw in a tilled system. And that includes attractive creatures like this tiger beetle, which is a type of ground beetle. Um, this is a damsel bug, which is just a predaceous bug. And these species just represent kind of uh, some of the individuals you'll run across in no-till fields, and even harvestmen are more abundant where you have no-till. So no-till just provides a stable environment, and if we don't mess it up, the predator populations will join in um, after some of the insect feeding, some, some of the plant feeding insects move in, and that's a good thing. So the predators are a good thing. Kind of the kings of the field, though, are these things called ground beetles. Um, that green animal on the previous screen is a tiger beetle. It's a type of ground beetle, but this guy here is more representative of ground beetles. Um, I show you the adult stage in the lower right-hand corner and the larval stage in the upper left-hand corner. 
and they're both predaceous. So the larval stage is subterranean. It's a little worm that burrows through soil and it'll eat anything it can get its mandibles on, typically things that are its size or smaller, and the ground beetle does about the same. It so happens that these guys adore slugs. So if you have a lot of these, then your slug population tends to be smaller. In addition to eating slugs, they'll also eat the pests that I highlighted before. So black cutworm, true armory worm, stock borer, and wireworm, which are the pests that tend to be more problematic in no-till, these guys have a great taste for that stuff. So the more ground beetles you have, the better. And these data actually show that. And this happens to be, these happen to be data from another Northeast Sierra funded project that um, a colleague of ours down here at Penn State, Heather Carson has run for eight years. And this figure shows on the y-axis a pest feeding damage. So that's feeding damage to crops, usually in our case, corn. And the x-axis is the predator population. So the greater the pest, uh, greater the predator population, as you go along that predator axis to the right from zero to 15, the less pest feeding we see in the corn plants. So if we can foster these predator populations, we'll actually see less damage on our crops, which is kind of the bottom line to the whole story that I want to tell today. So that's the inspiration for the, um, for the overall story. And then let's get into some details. So I've already mentioned this, no-till has its benefits. The stability of no-till provides great habitat for natural enemies. But then if you add cover crops on there, what you're actually doing is providing more habitat and you're providing further connections in a food web. So by making a more complex cropping system by having cover crops and no-till, you actually get a stronger uh, food web that can help control your pest populations. All right. And in these systems, insecticides are often used. But I would like folks to look at insecticides a little bit more differently than they tend to be looked at. In typical corn growing systems, often soybeans too, insecticides are seen as necessary. They're, they're almost used preemptively in most cases. Um, but there's, there's no doubt that foliar applied insecticides, soil applied insecticides, or even seed applied insecticides, so these seed treatments tend to be overused. And mostly po folks are just using them as insurance and they're not usually um, convinced that they're actually doing what they need to do. Uh, so I would like them to be used a little bit more appropriately within an integrated pest management framework. That is, we're gonna scout for the insects, we're gonna see if they're at damaging populations, and then if we need to, let's use the insecticide. Um, because if we don't, if we just use insecticides blindly, they can be, there can be these unintended consequences where we're decreasing the number of good insects, and that could inadvertently make the pest populations worse, or we can even have environmental concerns. Most of the pesticides we use in crop fields end up in waterways, and it can cause a suite of concerns there. I'm not gonna provide any detail on that today, but suffice it to say that insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, all can get in water and cause their own suite of problems. And we're just trying to avoid that as best we can. And again, I want to emphasize that the unintended consequences are similar, whether it's a foliar applied insecticide, soil applied, or even these seed treatments. They all have uh, downsides that we need to keep in mind. Okay, so I think I'm supposed to pause there yes. and take any questions that have popped up. Great. So Nancy, do we have questions? We do. The first one is for Deborah. And it's, uh, it, the question is, are your SARE webinars archived and where can I find them? Um, so when we um, offer our October 10 uh, Farmer Grant webinar, we will record them for sure and then post them on our website. And I can provide a link to that in the, um, in the chat or the Q&A for that person. Okay. Second question uh, for John, are farmers releasing predators in no-till? No, um, they're not, because that would be kind of impractical. If you're a backyard gardener and you can go buy some uh, lady beetles or some eggs of praying mantises or something like that, then that's practical on that very small scale. But when you're talking about a 40-acre farm field, it becomes impractical. And frankly, there aren't any suppliers for insects um, on that scale. I mean, you'd need thousands of ground beetles. Um, and it's just not practical. So the best way to get these natural enemies in farm fields is to use no-till uh, to cover crop and then to use IPM. So you're trying to foster those populations and grow them in place rather than needing to buy them and release them, which is probably challenging to do anyway. 
So these two are kind of related. Uh, one's a comment. The ecological approach food web is very interesting and compelling. What are the data to support the increase in the food web? Uh, that's kind of deep. Um, it's kind of a lot of information there I would have to go into. We don't really have the time today. But suffice it to say, there are many studies that have shown that um, no-till is a better environment for predators. Um, that environment improves when you add um, add a cover crop and frankly increase crop rotational diversity on a farm scale if you're able to increase crop species diversity that also drives arthropod populations up and with that come these beneficial arthropods that can hold the pest populations down so um, I can't do very well answering your question um, without just kind of repeating myself but there's a large body of literature that has showed that if you enhance crop rotational diversity and local diversity arthropod diversity will go up and uh, with that, the good insects come and the bad insects go down. That's a simplistic version, but that's kind of the nutshell of it. We have time for one more? Time for one more, yep. How does soil type affect a no-till system? <laughs> uh, soil type can affect a no-till system. Um, not being a soil scientist, I'm going to back off from answering that question as the listener would like me to. But suffice it to say that um, no-till can be pulled off in most any system that I'm aware of, it, when we're talking about field crops, vegetables are a little bit more challenging. Still hold on, my phone is ringing here. <laughs> Didn't plan on that. It's okay. All right. It's amazing that we have this technology that can bring everyone together from all around the world instantaneously, so. <laughs> I shut it off. Um, but anyway, um, I was saying, yeah, so no-till probably more challenging in a, um, in a sandier soil. Frankly, I don't have much experience with that, but um, we have a range of soils in Pennsylvania. And again, about 75% of our acreage is in no-till. So a lot of folks are encountering different types of soil, but they're, they're implementing no-till nonetheless. Great, well, thank you. And as I say, keep putting your questions there and we'll answer them at the next break. So John, you're going to tell us about uh, recent research that you've done on slug management. Yeah, we're gonna try. And uh, I'll start with this figure here. Um, and this figure shows average slug populations in two types of fields. The x-axis here shows just the corn growing season it's from you know, May through October. And the vertical axis shows number of slugs per trap. So to track slug populations, we just use pieces of shingle. We cut up white shingles, um, just like roofing shingles, and we put them in the field and the slugs will gather under there. And it turns out it, it's an artificial shelter and we can just go count slugs. So what this figure shows is that kind of have slug populations vary throughout the season. Um, but the red line shows the number of slugs we find where we have corn planted with a, a, uh, a seed that's been coated with an insecticide. So these are neonicotinoid seed treatments. Neonic in the title is just short for neonicotinoid. And the blue line shows an untreated seed, so a seed that doesn't have the insecticide on it. And you can see with this simple figure that over the course of the growing season, we tend to have more slugs where we have the insecticide coated on the seed to where we don't. So from just this figure alone, you might be able to make the hypothesis that neonicotinoid seed treatments are making slug populations worse. So that is the very hypothesis that we tested in a field experiment that I'll walk you through. So this was done a couple years ago on our research farm here in the uh, center of Pennsylvania. Um, and we had 12 plots, six of which were treated and six of which were untreated. The treated plots, um, this was in soybeans, the treated plots had thymethoxin, which is one of the neonicotinoid insecticides, coated on the seed. It also had a fungicide coated on the seed. And the untreated was a, was a naked seed. There was no fungicide, no anything on the seed. Um, we've done plenty of work to show that the fungicides are not part of this story. But if you have questions about that, please ask. Um, so again, we had six plots for treatment, and these were about quarter acre plots and we planted our soybeans in a, this is a no-till field on 30 inch rows, which is kind of unconventional for most soybean growers, but we did that so we researchers could get down the row um, without um, too much trouble. And I have four figures that I'm gonna walk you through just to kind of tell the story. This first figure shows yield on the y-axis and the number of soybean plants per acre on the x-axis. So this makes good sense, I hope, to most people that as you increase the number of soybean plants per acre, the yield goes up. Um, but notice the color of the dots. 
right? So where we have a black dot, that's where we have the insecticide in the system. The white dots is where we don't. So you tend to have fewer plants per acre and lower yield when we have an insecticide in the system. I should also point out that this was a very sluggy year. So slug populations were high. So slugs were the main pest or the only pest that we were dealing with in these fields in this year. And maybe I could have deleted some of the statistical not notation on the figure, but you can just ignore that. But remember that this is a field experiment. So this kind of tight alignment of uh, data is pretty great to see in a field experiment. But anyway, all right, let's move on to the second figure. This shows the number of slugs per trap on the x-axis. So that's the number of slugs we counted per shingle on a weekly basis. And the vertical axis here is soybean plants per acre. So what we see as the number of slugs under our traps goes up, the number of soybean plants comes down. Of course, slugs are eating soybean plants, so that makes sense, and that would translate to a lower yield. But where we have the insecticide in the system, we have more slugs, fewer plants per acre than lower yield. So it seems as though the neonicotinoids are fostering higher slug populations just based on this figure. All right, and the next set of figures will bring the predators into play. So in my introduction, I talked about the value of no-till for conserving predators. Here's the business end of predators, and that's predation. So on the y-axis, we're measuring predation, and this is the percent of caterpillars removed from a field. So to measure predation, we'll take a caterpillar, we'll put a pin through it, and then we'll pin that caterpillar to the ground. And then over the course of the next couple hours, we'll check on that caterpillar occasionally to see what's eaten. If we did this experiment perfectly, we would use not sentinel caterpillars, but sentinel slugs for our predation measurement. But slugs don't have an exoskeleton, and they're very difficult to get to stay on a pin. Actually, they pull themselves off the pin, which is kind of gross. So we would do this perfectly with slugs. We can't do it with slugs, so we did it with caterpillars. So the caterpillar is a proxy for a slug here. But anyway, the higher the number, the better. We want to see everything eaten. Um, and then on the x-axis here, we have slug predators. To capture slug predators, we just put little cups in the field and we sink them to the surface soil level. And we just go out occasionally and see what's fallen into them. We count what we find. So as we see here, the number, as the number of slug predators goes up, predation goes up. But again, the color of the dots matter. So on average, where we have um, the insecticide coated on the seed, we have fewer slug predators and we get less predation. Then the final figure that I'll share with you um, relates this predation to slug populations. So on the x-axis here, we have predation. Again, the proportion killed. The same numbers that were on the left-hand figure on the vertical axis are now on the um, horizontal axis. So here again, the, the higher the number, the better. And the vertical axis is number of slugs per trap. So as predation goes up, the number of slugs per trap um, comes down. But again, the color of the dots matter. So on average, where we have the insecticide, we have less predation and more slugs. So we interpret this to mean that the insecticides that are coated on those seeds are disrupting biological control, or what some people call natural control. So the control that can be provided by these predators um, is being disrupted by these insecticides. And we know how this is happening. It's happening because slugs are mollusks, as I've already mentioned. These mollusks are not sensitive to many insecticides. So these mollusks will feed on soybean plants with the treated seed. They get the insecticide in their bodies, but they're not sensitive to that insecticide. Then one of these predators will come along, bite the slug, and get a killing dose or a poisoning dose of that insecticide. So the insecticide is directly disrupting biological control when it's transferred from the slug to the predator. So this means to me, this little story means that farmers should manage for the pests that they have. Many farmers call me in and tell me that slugs are the worst problem they have. They don't really worry about black cutworm as much or wireworms as much. They worry about slugs. So if that's the case, then I encourage farmers to get those insecticides out of the field. Don't use um, corn or soybeans that have the insecticide coated on the seed. Um, but scout fields and find out if you need an insecticide. If you do, based on the pest populations that are there, then do something about them. Because we know from this example that insecticides can make slugs worse. We know from other data that the insecticides generally can make other populations worse if the insecticide is being used blindly. One thing to note is that while this story I just told you is very seed treatment specific, 
Research came out in 2017 that showed the same phenomenon that can occur with a broadcast application of insecticide. So if you're applying insecticide across a field traditionally, that will kill predators and then slug populations can be made worse. So the same story more or less came out of some researchers in Australia, not as seed treatments, but by a broadcast application of insecticides. So this is a um, kind of a larger issue, right? Because we want to make sure our pest populations stay in check. And if insecticides or our preemptive efforts are making them worse, we want to know that. But we also want to know if the system is strong enough to stand on its own. And in many cases, diversity or using no-till and cover crops can provide that stability. So the previous question I had is what is some of the what are some of the examples that the predators can make a difference? Well, here's an example where predators can make a difference. So this is these are data coming from the University of Delaware, and I'll just provide a sketch of the story. Um, in this system, this was a six-year study that studied four different types of systems. One was a continuous corn system where preventive insecticide was used. One was a corn soybean rotation. Another was a corn soy wheat rotation. Another was a corn soy wheat rotation with cover crops, the last of which they used IPM to scout for trouble and deploy insecticide if necessary. And this system, the worst pests were in continuous corn where they're using the preventive insecticides and the fewest pests were where they were using IPM in this more diverse system with cover crops. So this aligns very well with what we saw with our little slug project, that preventive insecticides don't necessarily make things better. In fact, they may make things worse. It's likely because they're limiting the predator populations there. And the reverse of that would be in this more diverse rotation with cover crops, and you're using IPM, you probably have stronger predator populations that can help with pest control. Okay, so I'll stop again and ask any, answer any more questions. Okay, Nancy, do we have any more questions? And actually, while she's looking at that, um, what, is, what is the photograph that's on your question slide? Oh, yes, so that's a, a type of assassin bug um, that's fairly common in Pennsylvania this time of year. I'd be surprised if it wasn't in New York. It's called a wheel bug, and it's eating a Japanese beetle. Some people tell me nothing eats a Japanese beetle, but there we have photographic evidence that wheel bugs will eat Japanese beetles. Cool, great. So Nancy, do we have a question? We do have a question, and again, it's for Deborah. So my question is, does Northeast SAIR require any particular metrics in proposed projects, such as improvements in bottom line? Uh, yeah, the answer is yes. Um, so in our proposal review criteria, we are looking for you know, potential impacts on the three Ps, which are you know, profitability, uh, planet, protection of natural resources, um, environmental integrity, and then uh, people quality of life. So we do um, look at those in terms of the review. And then also um, for the farmer grant program I mentioned earlier, we do have an expectation that they share results with other farmers. And then some of our other larger grants use what we call um, outcome funding. So um, in there it's, uh, we have a performance target that really specifies what that um, change in bottom line, whatever that is, is going to be. Okay. That's all I have. Okay, is great. anyone else oh, hearing this horrible sound in the sound? Sounds like uh, no. popcorn popping. No. no. <laughs> okay, I'm going to get off and get back on. Okay. All right, great. All right, wonderful. So, uh, John, you had uh, an example that you wanted to show us um, that was a good illustration of, of this. Right. Um, I'll provide a quick example before I move into the, the SARE example. Well, I guess they're both SARE based examples, it's just like a, a great inadvertent advertisement. So, we have something um, that's been going on here at Penn State for a number of years now called the um, Diversified Dairy Cropping Systems Project. Um, and in this, I'm, I'm just the entomologist on this team. It's a large team of a number of researchers, and again, it's headed by Heather Karsten. But in this effort, we're comparing um, a simple two-year corn soybean rotation with no cover crops with more diverse um, six-year rotations um, that we call either the grain rotation or um, the forage rotation. And the goal of this is to see if we can grow all the needs of a dairy farm um, on the farm without really needing external inputs. So we're trying to grow all the fuel, fuel feed and forage for the dairy farm. 
But from a pest management perspective, it's a fairly straightforward project. We're, we're simply comparing rotation that is including preemptive efforts, including BT seed for the corn, their seed treatments on the corn and the soybeans, and then after planting, we're putting a broadcast pyrethroid down, like many farmers will do, to something, to these more diverse rotations that use IPM. So there's no BT in our corn um, entry, uh, there are no seed treatments on the corn or soybeans, and we're only deploying insecticides as necessary. And much like that University of Delaware example, the pests are worse in these simpler rotations where we're putting the preventative treatments out. Um, I don't have the time to provide too much um, uh, information on this, but suffice it to say the, um, the corn yield in all these rotations is about equivalent, so we're not seeing any cost of doing this. It's just a little bit more um, man hours to implement IPM. Okay, um, so I strongly believe that folks need to kind of optimize their insecticide uses. So a lot of farmers will use it blindly um, just because they feel it must have a benefit because we're any, any um, the only good insect is a dead insect. I think quite the opposite is true. I think if we can use integrated pest management to protect those allies and pest control, those predators, uh, we'll be a whole lot better off. So this means we should scout, look for pest populations that are economically significant, use economic thresholds that are published in a variety of systems, and then use those insecticides only when it makes economic sense to avoid disrupting that natural control. Okay, and then I'll just quickly go over a, one example um, that I've um, kind of developed with my buddy here, Lucas Criswell. Um, so Lucas and I were funded on one of these partnership grants back in 2010, so nearly um, eight years ago, and that started our kind of research relationship together. So Lucas is a no-till farmer um, in Union County, which is central Pennsylvania, and that's him with his dad. Lucas on the left, and he's a strong believer in soil health, um, and I've gotten to believe in IPM a little bit. And the beginning of our relationship was very simple. We were watching a, a slug population take away one of his barley fields, and he had this observation. He said, John, if we just provided the slugs with a different food source, couldn't we stop them from feeding on my crop? I was like, yeah, I don't know. Let's find out. So that's what we applied for the uh, partnership grant for, and we got it, and then we did the subsequent research. So what we, what we did is we you know, just had a little brainstorming session and we figured out it would be good to try to put rye between rows of corn or soybeans. So we did this in both corn and soybeans. This picture shows soybeans. And what you can see in that plot right in the middle of the screen is that we have a row of soy, then a row of rye, and that's cereal rye, and then soy, rye, soy, rye, soy, rye. Off on the left, we have a bare plot where we just have soybeans with nothing between the rows. So what we ended up doing is comparing um, predator populations and slug damage in these types of plots, just to see if planting rye between the rows has a benefit. And indeed it does. So what we have here on the y-axis is our slug rating. So when we look at individual plants, um, we'll apply a rating of zero to four, um, a four being a nearly dead plant and a zero being an untouched plant um, as a measure of how heavily uh, or how much feeding the slugs are doing. So when we didn't have rye between the rows, so where it shows no rye, we had a significantly higher slug rating than where we did have rye between the rows. So we interpret this to mean that the slugs are actually feeding on that rye more than they're feeding on the corn or the soybeans. So that's distracting the slugs. The other side of the same coin is that where we had the rye, we had significantly more ground beetles. So the y-axis here is the number of individuals where we had no rye between the corn rows or the soybean rows, and where we had rye between the soybean rows or the corn rows. And you can see we have about three times as many ground beetles. Okay? So these data were very encouraging that putting rye between rows can distract slugs and provide more habitat for uh, ground beetles and even other predators. Um, Lucas then implemented this in his fields without even talking to me. So he establishes a cover crop every fall, in this first year he tried it, he established a cover crop but left a gap by not planting some of the rows in his cover crop so he could come back there and then plant his corn into those empty rows. So that's what you see here. See we have the, this is in the spring, that cover crop was established in the fall, and he's planting corn into those blank rows with the expectation that we'll see the same thing, that the slugs will be distracted by the cover crop, they'll feed on that more than on the emerging corn plants, and we'll have a better population of predators. It worked so well that first year that he stopped leaving the rows and he planted his cover crop in the fall and just planted his corn and soybeans directly into his cover crop the following spring. 
Some of his neighbors stopped him and told him he was an idiot, but it worked out awfully well for him. So much so that he went even a step further. Um, so he started rolling his cover crop. So he invested in these rollers on the front of every row unit of his corn planter. Um, and I can talk to you about where to get those rollers and what they mean and all this stuff, but I'll show you this picture in a second of how they work. So, so when he's planting and his planter is on the ground, he is rolling his cover crop and planting his seed at the same exact time. And this is what it ends up looking like. So you can see on the right, this, the height of his, uh, of a cereal rye. So this is probably in late May. Um, and he's starting, this is a roller pass he's already gone through. And you can see as a night, nice layer of thatch between the rows, um, but you can see where the corn or the soybean is going to come up. And that thatch does a couple things. One, it provides a great habitat for natural enemies. Two, it provides a great barrier against weeds. Three, it provides an alternative food source for the slugs. Okay. So can I just, um, can I just ask the question? So what we're seeing here is um, the cover crop that was on the right-hand side, the tool, was planted in the fall. And then he goes over it in the spring and flattens it out and puts the corn in, in between. Is that what's- Correct. So where you have a, a, a wide green band is where the cover crop was rolled down. Then that brown band is where the corn seed was put mm -hmm. and so on. Great. Okay, exactly. cool. Um, and this is how it used to look after Lucas was done planting. So this is just a close up on one of the rows. But now he does it, he doesn't have row cleaners anymore. So you don't actually see any bare soil. And he likes it that way because he wants his soil to be covered all the time. But this is how it looked in version three of this. He's now on to version four. Um, and he's done a bunch of side by side tests because he doesn't trust me um, any more than he should trust anybody else with his own business. So he's done some side by side comparisons of where he has. Um, like a treated, traded seeds, so that would be Acromax is a traded product, so it has a gene in it that prevents feeding by um, caterpillars. And he compared that to a seed that was, had no traits and also had no insecticide coated on the seed, and he gets the equivalent yield. But he's saving about $9,000 each year in pesticides, so he doesn't get Christmas cards anymore from his chemical dealer, which he's not that sad about. He did like the gentleman, but he's not that sad because look at all the money he's saving. So this system has really worked out for Lucas very well. Um, and one additional benefit is that thatch layer that's between the rows persists well into August. So these pictures are from plots where he did it and where he didn't do it. On the right is where he did roll the cover crop. On the left is where he didn't. And in August, you can still see that thatch layer. So it's continuing to provide moisture conservation, it's providing habitat for natural enemies, and it's providing suppression of weeds well into August which is great. Um, so just to kind of wrap up here, um, we know that more diverse crop rotations have fewer pest problems. That includes slugs. So I encourage growers that if they're not doing no-till, take a step and start no-tilling. If you're not using diverse, cover, uh, diverse rotations, try to diversify your rotation so you have more of a mix of crops um, year after year. And then try cover cropping between those cash crops. Value soil health, so we're putting more organic matter and soil health, uh, into the soil and actually improving soil quality. Um, but at the same time, we're also building these natural enemy populations. But if we're going to build natural enemy populations, then we have to scrutinize our insecticide use. We're not going to just blindly put insecticides out because that's counteracting our goal of building these populations of good insects. So the way to do that then is integrated pest management. So we're going to scout. We're going to use economic thresholds and we're going to apply insecticides only when it makes economic sense. So getting away from the blind faith insecticide model that so many um, farmers have gotten used to. Okay, I think that's about it. Um, Jan, I'm happy to take any questions if any have cropped up since. Okay, we'll see. Are there any questions that have come up, Nancy? Actually, I have a question. So what are the downsides of using uh, no-till? Uh, some of the downsides of using no-till are you have to wait a little bit longer for the soil to warm up. You have to wait a little bit longer for um, soil to dry out. Um, you need different equipment. You'll need a no-till planter. Your typical planter won't work as well. Um, and you have to, one of the real downsides, according to some, is that you rely completely on herbicides or more completely on herbicides for your weed control. 
If you can use cover crops in addition to no-till, then you, the cover crops become an ally in weed control as well as an ally in insect control. But that's where, those are some of the downsides that people highlight um, in terms of moving to no-till. You have a couple more challenges. And I, I think it's safe to say that it's a more management intensive system when you move to um, no-till because you have to kind of stay on top of things. But these cover crop systems like what Lucas has gotten into are even more management heavy. So this is not for the faint of heart, but the point is to show a way that other people are doing something a little bit differently to tackle their problem with hope that that would inspire some of the listeners to think a little bit differently about their systems and what they might be able to try rather than relying on the same old thing. Yeah, I can definitely hear the innovation and in, uh, that you know of him trying different iterations and and playing around with it. So it's, it definitely explains it. Though. So Nancy, do we have any questions? Uh, we have one question, and then I have a question. So I'll ask the first one. Any idea what percentage of farmers use IPM? Is it more common in horticulture or vegetable crops? That's a great question. Um, I don't have a great sense of how many farmers use IPM, but it used to be the case that IPM was the rule in field crop production um, because the, um, the crop value is a whole lot lower, the acreage is a whole lot greater, so it used to be unreasonable to try to treat like a 100 acre cornfield with insecticides. It just didn't make sense unless there was an economically damaging pest population out there. So for a long time, in field crops, IPM was the norm. Now that we have kind of these preventive, preventative tactics come standard, so when you buy a bag of corn seed, um, you have genes in the corn that'll stop insects from feeding, you have insecticides and fungicides coated on the seed. Those, um, I guess, products have encouraged people to move a little bit away from IPM in large acreage crops. I'm doing all I can to help push them back. Um, but when you have higher value crops like fruit and vegetables, it's, e it's easier to justify um, using the insecticide um, and you just have lower economic thresholds in those cases and which are easier to reach. So I don't have a great understanding of how many growers are, are using IPM, but I think the number is low enough that um, I'm going to continue to encourage folks to, um, to adopt. So that's my question is how do I get the farmers around me to adopt? I live in an area where uh, one family rents uh, hundreds of acres and it's corn and soybeans for the most part uh, and some winter rye and wheat um, and they till and I see the soil blowing around all winter and I know they use treated seed and I would love to get them off of that. It's not my land so I don't have a lot of recourse. You want to come and do a presentation for them? Sure. Um, <laughs> it's difficult to get, so you need to connect with growers and make them see that what you're talking about matters. Um, and that's not always easily done because frankly, IPM takes more time and more effort to implement than using some of these preventative tactics or just spraying insecticides based on the calendar. It, it's more involved. The, the way that I've tried to make progress recently is by connecting with farmers that strongly believe in the value of soil quality and this newer thing that people call soil health. Because if farmers believe that they, um, they can change the quality of their soil by the way they farm, then they are also sensitive to the notion that some of the inputs that they put in their fields can change the quality of their soil. So blindly pumping um, insecticides or fungicides into fields um, that may not need those things can degrade the quality of some of the services that those soils can provide. Um, we have a research program underway in collaboration with um, colleagues at University of New Hampshire and, and Cornell University where we're evaluating the influence of insecticide and fungicide use on soil quality. Um, soil quality can be measured in a bunch of different ways. We, of course, have set up the variables that we're tracking because we think they'll be sensitive to, um, to the pesticides we have in mind. So I hope in, a, in two years, maybe, Nancy, that we'll have some data that can directly um, address 
the influence of these insecticides on on um, variables of soil that matter. We certainly know um, from research that we've already done and others have done, it's not a secret, that if you're using insecticides unnecessarily, you have fewer predators and that leaves your fields more vulnerable to pest outbreaks. But that can be a difficult thing to get a grower to care about if they don't believe in the first place that the natural enemies are providing any value. Um, but what we can tell them is typically when there's an insect outbreak, even if they're using an insecticide regularly, that's because the predators aren't around. So I guess the, that was kind of a long-winded answer, but the simple answer is that you, I'm, we try to connect with growers on a, on, a, um, on a topic that they care about, and soil health seems to be a good entry point. And folks that are tilling, um, aren't as well connected to soil quality as other farmers are, I guess is what I would say. Great, thank you. I'm gonna, uh, armed with some of this, <laughs> maybe approach them and see if they are at all interested in hearing. The other, other detail to remember, Nancy, is that um, in New York State, that, that's where you are, um, no-till can be a little bit more challenging because you're, you know, you're farther north, you wanna get a jump on the growing season, um, and that can be an argument that gets pushed back at you, but I think Deb will vouch for people in Vermont, northern Vermont, that are no-tilling, um, people in Ontario that are no-tilling, people in Quebec that are no-tilling, so it's a matter of, uh, of desire in many cases, too. Yeah, and to go along with that, um, Nancy, part of um, maybe a strategy that some extension uh, educators have used is really the peer-to-peer -peer learning. So having someone like a Lucas that's been really successful and has worked with John sort of deliver that message of like, this is why this matters to me and this is how I, I do it. It's a different um, coming from someone who's a practitioner and can speak, you know, better speak the language. Um, we've here in Vermont, we've had a really good success with adoption in that way. Great. So I just got two questions on the Q&A. Uh, um, can you name probably, some of the natural enemies? We can probably do one. I'm just looking okay. at two minutes. So we can uh, can you name some of the natural enemies that you would want to see in your soil? Yeah, the, um, the first set of natural enemies I would mention are ground beetles. Um, they're kind of the biggest uh, out there and they can take down the largest range of prey. And again, a lot of ground beetles, the larvae and the adults um, are participating in that predation. Um, you would just like to see a range of generalist natural enemies. So that could include uh, soldier beetles, um, harvestmen, uh, spiders, uh, even firefly larvae are predaceous and they're great slug predators. So um, I love to see an abundance of predators, but a diversity um, can matter also. Uh, and, and farming this way can really promote them. So you want to see rove beetles, um, soldier beetles. All kinds of things like that. I'm um, probably not providing the, the list that you want to hear, but there's um, just want to promote as many natural enemies as you can. And and if you use a, a particular cover crop, you're not going to promote a different type of ground beetle versus uh, um, you're not going to promote different types of ground beetles by one cover crop. It's just generally Im improving the populations is what I'm trying to say. Poorly, I recognize. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. So, thank you. Could you just uh, forward the slide set for me, please? Sure. Okay. So, there's a couple of things I want to mention before we close out. Uh, one is we have a, a place on our website where you can find colleagues to collaborate with. And uh, John's presentation is a fantastic example of that, of collaboration and working with farmers. So um, if you go to this link, you can put in a profile. So for example, John would put in a picture and a little bit about what he's interested in and what he does research and what he's interested in, in working on a colleague, working with, on, with a colleague, working on with a colleague. And, um, and so it's our way of increasing collaboration in the Northeast. So feel free to go there and, and put your profile in. And next slide. There, the um, archive of today's webinar is going to be at that link. And I'll also send out an email to everybody who's registered. Um, and it'll be next week um, that you'll get a copy of the recording and it'll be edited. So it'll be easier for you to follow. And next slide. 
And uh, we also have a partnership uh, grant program and uh, RFA is now out, uh, just like Deb's um, programs out. And uh, we're doing a webinar tomorrow on that, uh, tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock, same time. And uh, the deadline for grants for us is November 15th, which I believe is a Thursday this year. And I also want to acknowledge uh, that we are funded by NIFR, uh, it's a USDA, part of USDA, and um, as, uh, as is Northeast there. So if you appreciate uh, that this webinar, I know that, that that's a source of the funding. And um, I also just want to end by saying thank you very, very much to uh, Deb for arranging this all and coordinating it with John and John for um, your beautiful presentation. You win the prize for best pictures for sure. Okay. And uh, it was a beautiful combination of um, beautiful pictures, interesting research and stories to go with it. So I just found it uh, a really delightful combination and I just appreciate both of you uh, taking the time to do this because everyone's busy and, I, and it takes something to put these together. So thank you. So. And um, with that, uh, I will end the webinar and look for an email with, uh, with the link to the recording. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.